following editorial is my own opinion and does not reflect the views of any companies to whom I may be currently attached or have been attached in the past. Specific quotes will be from publicly accessible articles, which will be linked to in the info section of this video. Before beginning this discussion, it's important to note the following. It's not creatives alone who suffer. As of 2008, 1 in 10 Americans have claimed to suffer from some form of depression, according to the CDC. This is a widespread issue that is not strictly unique to a single group of people. While the issues we're going to discuss are common, creatives are at higher risk for mental illness. It at least partially stems from a problem with filtering or gating the many stimuli that flow into the brain. For this reason, some creatives organize their lives in order to be isolated from human contact for long blocks of time. It could be an explanation for the stereotype of the artist as a reclusive, evasive person. The notion of the tortured artist is a stubborn meme. Creatively, it states, it is fueled by the demons that artists wrestle in their darkest hours. The idea is fanciful to many scientists, but a new study claims the link may be well-founded after all, and written into the twisted molecules of our own DNA. In a large study, scientists in Iceland report that genetic factors that raise the risk of bipolar disorder and schizophrenia are found more often in people in creative professions. Painters, musicians, writers, and dancers were, on average, 25% more likely to contain the gene variants than professions the scientists judged to be less creative, among which were farmers, manual laborers, and salespeople. Now this could start explaining some mental issues, but if we're going to get at the root of what seems to be pervasive depression in famous artists throughout history, from Shakespeare to Pollock, we're gonna have to start asking more questions. To start, if depression affects so many diverse groups of people, why are creative types singled out? What's the link between the two? While the possible solutions are many, the mind is a very complicated subject after all, countless psychologists and psychiatrists tend to agree that major depression is amplified in those who tend to ruminate on their thoughts. For example, someone who doesn't take the time to deeply consider their thoughts regularly may have a stressful day at work or school, but when they come home from it all, it's easier to forget than not. On the other hand, there are certain types of thinkers who naturally are drawn to play stressful events over and over again, thinking about what happened, what they could have or should have done differently, how the details of what occurred will affect the rest of their lives, and so on. Creative thinkers tend to fall into the latter group, replaying events over and over again to better understand them. A result on focusing on these thoughts then, according to Yale psychologist Susan Nolan Hoxima, is immense depression or a feeling of hopelessness. Yes, some studies have shown that creativity and depression are linked, but correlation doesn't equal causation. We know depression and creativity coexist, but well, it's like this. If you have severe depression, you have to be pretty darn creative to survive it. But it's also something that can only take us so far. Depression isn't something I struggle with, it's something I live with. It's not an adversary so much as a roommate these days. Sometimes I can't seem to get around it, other times I forget it's even there. And depression and creativity, expansive thinking and self-destruction, it all seems to be part of the same ball of thread. However, the pieces are frayed, woven together, tangled and wrapped around each other. It doesn't seem to be possible to move one end without moving the other. The creative person may have to confront criticism or rejection for being too questioning or too unconventional. Too much openness means living on the edge, and sometimes the person may drop over the edge. Often, when people are creating something new, they end up straddling between sanity and insanity. I think these results support the old concept of the mad genius. Creativity is a quality that gave us Mozart, Bach, Van Gogh. It's a quality that's very important for our society, but it comes at a risk to the individual, and 1% of the population pays the price for it. But why is depression and extreme anxiety still such a strong force? As the changing and growing organism humanity is, shouldn't we have moved past something so seemingly limiting? From an evolutionary standpoint, we could now say that depression is a psychological desire to be better, to be stronger, to reflect on where we've made mistakes, and to find ways to improve ourselves overall. Research from Andy Thompson and Paul Andrews confirms this approach, stating that depression is an evolutionary way for us to tightly focus our attention on what needs changing in our lives. Our minds can approach concepts with various levels of zoom. We can zoom in on the finer details or zoom out to see the big picture. Creative types tend to have a wider picture of the world, which allows us to twine together seemingly disparate concepts and come up with less obvious ideas. We often see the world for its possibilities rather than its realities. I think this is the starting point for understanding why creativity and depression are linked. As George Bernard Shaw put it, reasonable people adapt themselves to the world. Unreasonable people attempt to adapt the world to themselves. All progress, therefore, depends on unreasonable people. We creative types tend to be incurably unreasonable. And that's good, honestly, but it's also terrible. In seeing the way the world could be, we dream of a place we cannot reach, and we base our sense of satisfaction on a comparison to that idealized world. 
So how, as an artist, can we thrive in the midst of bouts of depression or mental illness? That alone is a subject so deep that I actually wrote a book about it. It's called Art is Not a Friend, a guide for the driven through depression and dreams. Now, I'll talk more about my book later, but for now, I'll just say it's important to be really picky about who you let into your life, and especially into your creative work. Latch on to people who make you feel like anything is possible, especially if they've done it already. Balance is key. Experiencing present joy can paint hints of color and hope upon even the dreariest and most confounding moments. As Albert Camus said, in the depths of winter, I finally learned there was within me an invincible summer. And whether you're an artist or not, whether you suffer from depression or not, those words are understood. It is our tremendous resilience as people that carries us through difficult times. There are thorns, yes, but there are roses too. Though creatives experience higher rates of mood disorders than the general population, the extremes of highs and lows tend to be brief, balanced by long periods of normal effect or euthymia. During these respite periods, Creatives frequently reflect upon and draw from memories and experiences of their darker times to create their best art. However, as someone who suffers, this certainly doesn't make it feel worth it. If Van Gogh's illness was a blessing, the artist certainly failed to see it that way. In one of his last letters, he voiced his dismay at the disorder he fought for so much of his life. Oh, if I could have worked without this accursed disease, what things I might have done. Regardless of the challenges you may be facing, you should never face them alone. If you can afford it, get professional help. If you can't afford it, try to surround yourself with people who are supportive, who care. Should you find yourself considering serious self-harm, please use the numbers on the screen first. Call them before you do anything, please. I've been there. I've been through the fire. I've recovered, and I've drowned in flames again. Rinse, repeat. Yet each time I've survived depression, I've learned lessons. Lessons which help me the next time the dark tide rises again, as it has, and will. Through all this, I've carefully documented my journey, where I failed, and where I found my footing. The road from university graduate to art professional has nearly led to the end of my life several times, and I often felt like I was completely alone in this struggle. Yet, the older I get and the more people I meet, I've come to realize that so many artists muck through the same storms. I decided to write Art Is Not A Friend as a sort of guide map, a book I would give to my younger self could I go back in time to do so. I hope it helps anyone who reads it. My book is currently available at our website, thehungrycreatures.com, on our Cool People Cool Store page. If you do decide to buy it, please message us through our website's contact form. I would love to know what your thoughts on the book are, and I hope you find it helpful. This has been Cinema Cemetery, digging six feet deeper into filmmaking culture. Hey, thanks for watching that video. If you liked what you saw, give us a like. If you didn't, don't. We rotate through a series of shows, so there's always something new for you. We also have two stores. There's the Hungry Creature Boutique and the Cool People Cool Store. Also, if you like the music you heard in this episode, check out Fractal Impulse on Facebook and Bandcamp and Instagram, whatever social media, and all that stuff. Yeah, cool, bye.